वेलकम टू द फिफ्थ लेक्चर विच इज द बिगिनिंग ऑफ कैप्स्यूल नंबर थ्री इन दिस कैप्स्यूल वी आर गोइंग टू कंटिन्यू फर्दर आवर डिस्कशन अबाउट फ्लूड मैकेनिक्स सो दिस पर्टिकुलर कैप्स्यूल इज कॉल्ड एज बेसिक फ्लूड मैकेनिक्स पार्ट टू एंड इन दिस वी विल लुक एट टू लेक्चर्स टूडे वी डिस्कस सम फंडामेंटल फिनोमिना इन फ्लूड मैकेनिक्स वी डिस्कस विस्कस फ्लो रिनाउंस नंबर एंड बाउंड्री लेयर्स the bulk of the content for this lecture has come from this student atul vishwam who is a third year undergraduate student from aerospace department he undertook the same course a152 last semester and during the summer he has been helping me in creating content for this course so this particular capsule uh, the first lecture has been created by atul so thanks to atul for helping me out let's look at broadly what is our road map for today we start with an introduction to viscous flow and then we proceed to the consequences of viscosity in the flow which is a laminar and turbulent flow we then proceed to the concept of boundary layer which follows automatically from our discussion regarding viscous flow we looks at types of boundary layers there are two basic types as most of you know we just have a close look at them and finally we look at flow separation so this is the road map for uh, today's presentation let's start with a very simple experiment and in this experiment we are going to see the behavior of a few fluids so what do we see here we see four jars filled with four different liquids and in each of them we drop a small ball the marble into the corn syrup now so in the third one again we are going to drop the same ball so look the color can be deceptive and lastly we drop a marble into the and the last one is the one in which it will take the maximum time to reach down okay so four jars identical with four liquids first we we'll drop a marble into the water but there is a difference in the behavior so the question is why is there a difference in the behavior of the same ball in the same jar just because of the presence of the fluid okay and the reason for that is because some fluids are thick and some fluids are thin when you drop a ball in a thick fluid it takes more time to go down when you drop it in a thin fluid then it goes much faster okay all right so here is another animation which shows two containers in which two fluids are being dropped we notice that in one container on your left the light blue colored liquid it flows rapidly and tends to fill the container very quickly on the other hand we have this uh, orange colored fluid which takes much more time to occupy the volume of the container so which one is thicker it's obvious that the one which is orange in color is thicker because it's taking more time to fill in okay so recently we had a very interesting race in which uh the worldwide hero lost out to justin gatlin but this is uh, just to revive old memories this is the world record winning race safa 9.58 9.58 says the speaker 9.58 seconds okay so just like we have these runners who run we also have particles in a fluid that run against a resistance so let's see and uh, let's see how viscosity the property of the fluid helps us so essentially what is viscosity viscosity is basically a property of a fluid and this property manifests itself 
through a resistance to relative motion okay primarily because of friction okay so if a fluid is thicker it will have a higher viscosity if a fluid is higher viscosity it will have a lower flow rate let's have a look now we measure out equal proportions of our ingredients into our little containers so you have these small containers in the first heat of our race we have water rubbing alcohol and cream water finishes first with a time of 0.233 seconds and rubbing alcohol finishes last with a time of 0.4 seconds in the second heat of our race we're going to be racing olive oil lamp oil and vegetable oil lamp oil finished first with a time of 0.467 and olive oil finished last with a time of 0.633 seconds in the final heat of our race we're going to be racing honey maple syrup corn syrup and dish soap first to cross the finish line is maple syrup with a time of 1.33 seconds followed by the blue dish soap with the time of 4.633 seconds and then slowly but surely the great corn syrup crosses the line with a 19.5 seconds and then finally honey with a 20.767 seconds here are the results of our race just like we saw Water the race between the finish at least line first you have a race that has between the highest fluids. flow rate and the lowest viscosity honey was last across the finish line meaning it has the lowest flow rate and highest viscosity okay so usain bolt basically is water goes fastest all right now a question uh, throughout this presentation when you see this particular symbol we will ask a question and i would like you to ponder over this question and answer using the moodle page don't answer here this is the question to be done so the question is just like we have viscosity of fluids gases are also considered to be fluid so do gases also have viscosity and can you get some information maybe some videos which shows the viscosity of gases and the effect of the viscosity of gases on the flow okay. so that's homework proceeding further now it's it's good to know about viscosity and now let us do some basic calculations about viscosity using the bernoulli's principle about which we have studied so to do that basically we just have to go and read the assumptions now this was a question in one of in the in the quiz last time what are the assumptions under which the bernoulli's principle is valid and one of the choices was that the fluid has to be non viscous okay so does bernoulli principle apply when the fluid is viscous so we have to go and check out okay so let's look at first the most fundamental uh, flow which is a flow in a pipe in this video we are going to color the flow using a small dye and the speed of the flow is going to increase with time so you can see uh you can see the effect of that so this is low speed flow at low denoise number which we have not defined so far but i'll define very soon slowly the speed of the fluid is increasing as you can see this starts so you can see that the pattern behind the pattern as you go ahead is changing uh to see this difficult to model much higher speed flow transition flow the pattern changes much more rapidly but you can see there is a oscillatory structure and to some extent there is some uniformity in the structure so yeah but as you increase the speed to a very large value then there is a lot of dissipation of this fluid and you can see there is a very high level of mixing of the dye in the water let's watch it once again from the beginning and the diameter low speed flow hardly any oscillations if they are they are symmetric and they are of low amplitude just with the last as the flow so flow speed increases these flow, oscillations become higher and higher in amplitude you will start uh, to see this okay. difficult to model the structure uh, is transition flow and now this is actually unsteady flow because it is time varying turbulent flow it and what are you seeing are these streamlines streak uh, lines path so lines or time lines what so are these you can see how we want stream lines to turbulent flow so we can streak line plug flow correct will be very useful okay in the so what we see is that the velocity of the flow in a pipe affects the flow pattern 
So, when you have very low speed flow, then you have what is called as a laminar flow, which has little or no oscillations. When you have a much higher speed flow, you have a flow called as turbulent flow, where as you saw a lot of mixing takes place and there is a particular speed for a given pipe dimensions beyond which the flow converts itself from laminar to turbulent. Okay. So, what about external flows? This was inside the pipe. So, over an aeroplane wing which does not have any border on the top and the bottom, do we have do we have a possibility of laminar flow over the wings? So, this is another question on the Moodle. Can we encounter laminar flow in actual airplane wings? If the answer is yes, you have to give proof of that. It could be a video from a reliable source, it could be some kind of a photograph or a paper or a publication, anything that we can depend on. Please remember there are many frivolous things on the internet also. For example, one most common problem that you see is people showing the working of Bernoulli's principle, but actually it is Coanda effect. So, you will see many such videos, you have to be very careful, do not believe anything that blindly some, that, puts, that somebody puts up. Do not believe blindly that somebody puts up on the internet, apply your own logic and justification before you post it, because if you post something which is wrong, you are responsible for it. You cannot say I found something on the internet. This is not a clerical exercise where you just give a Google search, you find something, you post it. You have to own up to what you post. Okay. And if there are mistakes, it is ok. We all make mistakes, I make mistakes, so we can rectify our mistakes. So, let us see laminar flow over a wing cross section, but this is inside a wind tunnel. Okay. So, there are two main sources for this particular presentation. They are marked as double star and I think hash and at the end there is a slide which explains what these sources are. So, once I upload this presentation on Moodle, you will have an idea what the sources are. So, you can see here, it is clear visually also that the flow is smoothly going over and below the wing and I do not see too much of disturbance or turbulence behind. Okay. So, visually it seems that the flow is laminar. But remember this is in a wind tunnel, so this is still internal flow. My question was can we have laminar flow on a wing which is exposed to external flow. This is over a cylindrical body. So, here also it is almost perfectly symmetric. This is not a computer simulation, these are actual experimental results, but using dyes for visualization. So, here also we see that it is almost perfectly symmetrical. So, here also we can assume that the flow is absolutely or almost perfectly laminar. Proceeding further, we have a rectangular block and interestingly even here the flow can be laminar. So, the shape of the body alone does not guarantee or insist that the flow will become turbulent or laminar. As we saw over a wing, over a cylinder, over a rectangular block, you can still have laminar flow. So, shape is important, but not very, very important. It is not the only parameter. There are other parameters also which decide about the flow being laminar or otherwise. Yes, Mike. Intentional, this is actually basically an experiment called as a backward facing step. So, <clears throat> what you see is a rectangular block, but intentionally they have created a small gap, because they also want to investigate what happens if you have let us say a water tank over a building, which will have some kind of a overhang or a projection behind. So, it is intentional, they wanted to study in one experiment flow behind a rectangular body and also flow behind a backward facing step. So, that gap is intentional. I think you are talking about this particular gap, okay. this gap, this gap is intentional and notice the flow here is flowing, 
we do not see much turbulence still. Okay. So, by and large the flow is still laminar. Okay. Now, let us go to the question that we had asked in the class. We had this uh, question in the quiz oscillating flat plate. Here the plate is not oscillating, here the plate is fixed, but at a very high angle and still you see that the flow is laminar. So, this is another myth many people have. Many people think oh if the angle of attack or if the angle at which the body is placed is high, the flow will become turbulent, not necessary. You can have a very blunt body, you can have a body at a very large angle, still the flow can be laminar. Not always true, but can be also true. So, in other words, the orientation and the shape of the body alone is not responsible for the flow to become laminar or turbulent. This is a question which I would like you to talk about. How can we predict, first of all can we predict when would a laminar flow become turbulent? And if the answer is yes we can predict, then the question is what is the parameter or what is the mechanism with which you can be very sure. So, this was a problem that was being addressed by many fluid mechanics people in the beginning and this person he made some efforts to study these phenomena ok. And we will, but then my question is who is this guy? So, if you know the answer I would urge, urge you to raise your hands, why? Why let us do the following. Let us have a proper quiz, ok. So, I will give you four choices and I would like you to tell me, now of course, it, you all cannot be right, all may be wrong, there could be a fifth guy who did it and more than one cannot be right because if x did it, y did not do it. So, here you can use your elimination skills which you have picked up in your uh, examinations, right. So, please tell me. If somebody knows, raise your hand and obviously after two answers, if they are wrong, we do not want to go ahead because then you can guess, ok. Take a mic please, if there is a mic around, just tell me what do you think, who is this person? Osborne Reynolds, the answer is wrong. This is what I expected, this is what I expected people to answer, that is why this question. Because we talk about Reynolds number, because we talk about turbulent flow, people automatically assume it will be Reynolds. Oh, it is not Reynolds. It is a trick question. See what is the trick question? What does, what does it say? It says that I have made some efforts to study. He does not say I have discovered it, he does not say I am the first person, but he is the guy who actually did lot of efforts to study it. Okay. So, let us go on to yeah, someone there. My name is Rahul, so it is Prantal, Ludwig Prantal. Ok, Ludwig Prantal, that is also a good guess, but it is a wrong answer, ok. It is a wrong answer because Prantal is a very famous name in fluid mechanics, so it is a good guess, it is an intelligent guess. That man was great, we call him as the father of aerodynamics, so he must have done some good job, maybe he did this job. So, now we have only two remaining, ok. We have Arnold Summerfield and we have so, now can you guess, now you have only 50-50 chance, ok. So, you toss, yeah. So, the answer is Stokes, ok. Remember the Navier-Stokes equation, he is the guy, half of it, Stokes. Also remember that is a Stokes theorem also, that is what we will study. We will study about this particular uh, theorem later on, ok. Right, so it is uh, George Gabriel Stokes who was the first person to study this, but he could not formulate it properly. It was Reynolds who came ahead just like Gatlin has overtaken Bolt, ok. So, let us uh, understand Reynolds number, basically it is a ratio, ratio of two forces and therefore it is dimensionless. The inertial force which resists the motion because of inertia and the viscous force which creates a resistance to the motion. So, I would say the other way around, inertial force basically uh, tends to follow what is happening and viscous force is opposing. So, the ratio of that is called the Reynolds number and 
there is a critical value of Reynolds number for a particular fluid flow condition. It is different for pipes, it is different for plates, it is different for bodies. We call that as a critical Reynolds number because that helps you decide or identify the point of transition. Okay. So, the transition Reynolds number is called as the critical Reynolds number. So, this is our key, not the shape, not the fluid properties alone, not the angle. It is the Reynolds number of the flow that decides whether the flow is going to be laminar or turbulent. So, there are some typical values. If the flow is internal, it is between 3 to 5000. If the flow is external, it becomes 100 times more, 300,000, 500,000. And it is the best measure to compare two flows, the Reynolds number. And obviously, as the Reynolds number increases, the flow becomes less and less laminar or the laminar nature reduces till you reach a critical Reynolds number after which the flow becomes turbulent, laminar flow stops. So, if you look at a human blood flowing in the veins and the arteries, the Reynolds number is around 100. Why? Because blood is a very viscous vehicle. Viscous fluid. So, if the numerator is viscosity and that number is high, the Reynolds number will come down. So, there are people including in our department who are looking at the fluid mechanics of blood flow. In fact, interestingly, we have a PhD student who is an MD in cardiac surgery and he is now a PhD student studying flow of blood through artificial valves. So, if you get time, please visit the aerodynamics laboratory. You will find uh, we have created a small setup where we try to mimic the flow of blood through the heart, especially through the artificial valves. So, there we need these kind of studies. A swimmer operates at around 4 million Reynolds number. Of course, it depends upon the length of the swimmer and the speed of the swimmer also, but this is the approximate value. So, from 100 we go to 4 million. Large ships like this, they operate at Reynolds number of a few millions. So, what is the Reynolds number? First of all, there is a question there. So, can you name this ship? Anybody here who is a fan of ships? What ship is this? Let us go back to Moodle, fine. You can search and put it on Moodle. Now, what would be the Reynolds number of typical aircraft? Between around 6 million to 10 million typically. 6 to 10 million is the Reynolds number. So, when we talk about uh, aircraft and about aerospace engineering flows, we normally speak in millions. These typical UAVs that you fly, these remote control planes that you fly, what would be the Reynolds number? it would be around 0.3 to 0.5 million. Now, interestingly, there are many students who take up aero modeling as an activity and they make these remotely controlled planes. Is there anybody in the class who has made remote control planes or is interested in making RC planes? Just raise your hands. Okay. So, in our class, we have Saurabh who is actually a very accomplished aero modeler. Okay. So, Saurabh, a question addressed to you because of your experience. Um, in your experience of flying remote control planes, you must have attempted to get the aerodynamic characteristics of a particular aerofoil from the wind tunnel data or from the reports. But when you actually fly, did you observe any difference between the reported values of say the maximum lift coefficient against what you actually got? What is your typical experience? We are actually going ahead, we are talking about lift coefficient, we have not discussed it yet, but just wanted to know. So, if I look at lift coefficient, uh, in reality it is slightly less because you have got, uh, your wing is not completely smooth in reality, it has got little notches and things like that and they transit the flow from lamina to turbulent. No, that is not the main reason. Actually, even if I make a perfectly smooth wing. When I make an aero model, 
I will not get the maximum lift coefficient which I get for the same wing when I make a big aircraft. The main reason for that is there is a Reynolds number effect on the aerodynamic characteristics which many students do not know. So, what they do is they pick up data about a particular shape or aerofoil from a from some source, they make an aircraft, they do calculations and then they say we are not getting the performance. And then they assume what you assume that oh it is because of the uh, bad finish etcetera. That is one reason, but I will show you there are other reasons also. Okay. Let us go ahead. So, let us see there is a critical number of 2900 for a pipe. Let us see what happens to this particular flow when you move. So, what we normally do basically is so this is a flow in a pipe, this is not a computer simulation, this is just a photograph or a sketch. Okay. So, this is a non viscous flow in a pipe. Is it possible to have non viscous flow? Is it possible to have a fluid with no viscosity? That is the reason why I cannot show you a video, nor can I show you any, I, of course, I can show you a computer simulation in any CFD uh, tool, I can put viscosity 0 and get some results, but I chose not to do it. I chose just to show you a sketch. So, this is theoretical flow. You will never see this in real life that you have a pipe and the flow continues along straight lines parallelly. It is only in theory. Okay, what will happen if you have viscosity? Tell me, what do you what do you think will happen because of viscosity? Yes. If the pipe is circular, it is. It's a circular cross section pipe. So yes. there will be a parabolic velocity profile. Okay. Why will it be parabolic? Uh, because of the velocity gradient which is created due mm. to the viscosity, like the the fluid at the edge which is in contact with the surface of the pipe top and bottom okay will have a smaller velocity mm. as compared to the fluid so if i correct you do you think it will have any velocity or will it be zero velocity technically it is zero that is what we call it it is a boundary condition it's a no so slip condition it's no a no slip, slip condition. condition so 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 that means essentially we have something like this okay so, in the center of the pipe, the friction is only between the two fluid particles. At the edges, you have friction between the fluid particles and the pipe wall. So, you typically get this kind of a variation of velocity. Okay. Now, the question is, is it laminar or turbulent? Do not go by just the looks, there has to be some logic. So, let us see. Okay. So, if the flow is laminar, which is what it appears to be, then what will be the Reynolds number? Will it be low or will it be high? It has to be low. Okay. It has to be low. So, one can keep on increasing. Now, let us see, let us see a video about viscous flow over a solid surface. This is an experiment. Uh, so, you introduce a small pipe in the flow, you touch the floor and then you release the fluid and you take it up slowly. Okay. So, interestingly the fluid which was there at the bottom has remained stationary. This is the proof of what I was suggesting to you that in case you have a flow over in a pipe or in any container, the fluid that touches the surface is at rest. That is why we need a brush to clear off that. The presence the particle remains, okay. the fluid is flowing, but the particle remains. Why is it flowing? Because you can see those things moving, but on the surface it is not moving. That means the surface velocity is 0. Okay. So, this is because of friction, the friction between the fluid particles and the surface. Now, let us go to the flat plate. So, you have a camera which is stationary. So, it is Eulerian approach. The camera is stationary and there is an automatic carriage that tows a plate. So, the channel is stationary, the camera is stationary.
but this plate is moving in the fluid, plate with sharp edge. So, the camera is stationary, it takes a picture. So, you can see now the plate velocity is very low and you inject fluorescent dye. Notice how the structure of the flow field changes as the velocity of the fluid is increasing and hence the resonance number is increasing. Now we go to higher resonance number. See the difference in the flow field. So, this is the name given to this particular phenomena where you have a very large mass called a turbulent bulge and then you have these vertical structures inside. You can see those vortices which are continuously generated and they are, vert and they are uh, bursting also. So, when, when we study these things in more detail that is when we look at these kind of uh, pictures. Okay. So, here is just a snapshot of some uh, CFD calculations. CFD stands for computational fluid dynamics in which we simulate the fluid flow using certain standard equations that uh, can be used to model the flow. So, you can see that the fluid is almost stationary, very very low values of Mach numbers on the surface and as we go above. And when you go to when you go to the thin region outside, you have a very much higher speed flow of 0 0.712. So, with this basically you can say that when there is a flow over a flat plate, the flow pattern can be divided into two clear cut segments. One segment is the red area where the fluid velocity is uniform equal to the free stream velocity of whatever 0 0.172 or 175 and the viscous effects are limited only into a small area below the yellow and green curves lines. So, that is the only area. So, if you want to do a very simple analysis, let us say you have some equations available with you which are applicable only for inviscid flow and you have a flat plate to be investigated. So, what you can do after looking at this picture where one can conclude is if I replace the flat plate with the body of that shape, what shape? The shape below the yellow colored and if I do a non viscous analysis on a body of that shape. I will probably get the same results as on a flat plate with viscosity because the viscous effects are confined only in that small area. So, this is called as flow partitioning and this is the contribution of Prantl. Prantl was the person who first observed these boundary layers and he said oh we can divide it into two segments and then live with in viscous calculations in the non boundary layer area. This particular area may appear to be very small, but what is happening inside is very very drastic and dramatic. Okay. So, basically viscosity has spoiled the flow field. Yeah. 
the answer is here. So, you have a flow acting over a flat plate and we see that the effect of viscosity is confined only in this small zone which is colored yellow, green and blue where the velocity of the flow is lower than 0.172. So, what is happening here is the free stream Mach number is something like 0 0.172 or 0 0.175. So, ahead of the plate there is no problem, the flow is still not sonic, so there will be no uh, effect felt, so the flow will remain at the same Mach number. But when the plate starts, a small area starts getting built up over the plate in which the flow velocities are reducing and finally they reach the red value. So, analysis of a flat plate in viscous flow is equal to analysis of a body of that shape, shape equal to the shape of this yellow green band put in non viscous flow. So, this is what it is. So, this person said why do not you split into two regions and that is called as a boundary layer. 